Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Survival Saturdays. Um, we want to start off by saying thank you to everybody who subscribed, liked, and commented. If you're watching and you're new to the channel and haven't hit the subscribe button, please do it. It doesn't cost you guys anything, and it helps us immensely to bring you more content and be more direct and interactive with you guys in the chats. Otherwise, we have to go back and look for comments that you guys drop and then respond to them. It'd just be easier in real time, we think. So today we're going to keep moving on with Peter Darman's book. Um, and the next chapter we're getting into is what to wear. Okay, this chapter starts off by saying adventurers need clothing that will withstand the rigors of hostile weather and terrain. Here are the principles you should follow when selecting clothing for backpacking in wild areas. Above all, do not compromise when it comes to clothing. If you just uh, survived a plane crash or similar accident, the chances are that you will be dressed in light, comfortable clothes that are totally unsuitable to survival situations. In this case, you must improvise. We'll see the chapter on improvising clothing, tools, and weapons, which comes later. Um, however, if you are back a backpacker or similar adventurer, you should be better clothed and equipped to deal with a survival situation. And there is really no excuse for wearing substandard clothing and carrying poor equipment. Today, because of the explosion in outdoor um, leisure activities, there's a bewildering variety of clothing available to the backpacker with a corresponding diversity in quality and price. It is impossible here to give a detailed breakdown of the range of clothing currently available. Nevertheless, some guiding principles can be provided that will enable you to make a wise choice when selecting outdoor wear. All right, we're gonna talk about how to choose your survival clothes. So laid out in front of us, we got a few examples. This is not a catch-all. Um, these are just gonna give you a visual cue of things maybe that you can look out for or could pique your interest. Um, so how to choose your survival clothes. Above all, you must select the proper clothing for the job. For example, clothing that is suitable for a Sunday afternoon stroll in a temperate climate will not stand up to the severe conditions encountered in the arctics, tropic, or desert. Don't skimp on anything when it comes to clothing. It will be the main factor that protects you from the cold, wet, and wind. But how do you know what to kit yourself out in? Simply go read a book, go through a plethora of magazines dedicated to outdoor pursuits, go on camping exhibitions, Go camping and go to camping and survival shops and discuss your requirements with staff who have knowledge about such things. In short, like all special force special forces units, undertake detailed research before you embark on an operation. So, what does that all mean in a nutshell? Um, do your research. Your whatever area that you're in is get really going to dictate what type of survival clothing you're in. If you're in California. You know, you're going to want some type of cold weather gear in case something happens, but you're going to have more warm weather gear than somebody, let's say, in Michigan or uh, Maine is another cold state, right? Um, so in this way, you will not only find out the hard way that clothing you purchase is a total unsuitable, is totally unsuitable for the expedition you're currently undertaking, a little proper planning will pay dividends in the end. Uh, Gore-Tex. Everybody's heard of Gore-Tex. That's the brand name of the uh, so-called material. So Gore-Tex is an excellent material for outdoor clothing. It's a breathable material which allows you to perspire and allows it to escape, but prevents water from re-entering or coming back in. Um, it's achieved through a whole bunch of micros microscopic Gore-Tex membrane, which has 9 billion pores per square inch. Those pores are 20 times smaller than the droplet of a water, but 700 times bigger than a molecule of water vapor. This prevents entry of wind and water, but allows perspiration to escape freely. Gore-Tex clothing is not cheap, but what price are you willing to put on your life? So a uh, quick example of the Gore-Tex 
is going to be one of these pants. We'll grab them real quick. All right, real quick. These look like a pair of normal jeans on the outside, but inside is a fleece type, I guess, Gore-Tex lining is whatever they call it. Um, it's like an off-brand, but it still does the job. Uh, these pants are extremely comfortable to maneuver in, walk around, and they still look like blue jeans on the outside, but they will definitely keep you warm. Um, the layer principle offers maximum protection and flexibility in all types of climate. The principle is very simple. Dead air is the best form of insulation and is the best way of uh, creating it. Um, and basically, you're trapping layers of air between clothing. The more layers you wear, the greater the insulating effect. But you also have to be aware, more clothes you wear, the less mobility you're going to have. Temperature control is also uh, very easy. Uh, all you have to do is basically take on layers or take off layers uh, to regulate your heat. Because you can overheat in the wintertime. That is a real thing. Um, remember, overheating can be as much as a problem as being in the cold. If you sweat when it's cold, the body chills when you stop sweating, and your sweat-soaked clothes will act as a conductor and draw heat away from you into the air around you. It is important to prevent this. Here's why layers, here's the layers you basically should wear. Next to skin, you should wear like a thermal underwear or something called long johns. So it's those tan ones there. We like to call these silk weights or um, high speeds is what we used to call them. But it's like it's like a silk weight material, and that against your skin is uh, very breathable. Uh, it allows perspiration to escape off of it into that dead air area in between your next layer. Um, over this should be a wool or some type of wool mixture. Again, you would wear if you were to wear these pants. You can show the underwear too. Here's a, a pair of silk trousers or a. So you have you have silk weight underwear, silk weight trousers, and then those those uh, jeans with the wool inside. That setup right there will honestly be good down to freezing levels, simply because it's layered and you have those air gaps in between it. Um, on top of the wool, you're gonna. I mean, nothing on this, but if you're wearing like a shirt and everything, because the the there's gonna be a matching top for those as well. Uh, so you'll have a top and bottom for the silk weights. Over that, you would wear a wool sweater and then a jacket over that wool sweater. So you have multiple layers there. And basically, when you come back in the house or whatever, you can shed two or three layers. And, you know, it's common to walk around in the silk weights after you come in because they're not soaking wet. They're, it's, it's a good thing to walk around and you feel comfortable in it. Um, you can also have a fiber-filled uh, man-made jacket. Down material is not recommended because... When it gets wet, it gets very heavy and it, get, and it loses a lot of its insulation. So something like uh, polyester jackets, like those, those puffy jackets, those were really good in the rain because they would shed water really quick. So stay away from down material. And then the final layer will be waterproof and windproof, which would probably be uh, those rain jackets, right? So that would be your outermost layer probably there. And that would be full protection basically in cold, wet weather and all this stuff. And the Air Force uses an acronym. It's called COLDER. And they may not use it anymore. Uh, but keep clothing cl clean. Avoid overheating. Wear long and loose layers. I'm sorry. Wear clothing loose and in layers. Keep clothing dry. Examine clothing for defects in wear. Keep clothing repaired. So colder is the acronym. Basically clean, overheating, loose, dry, examine, and repaired. And it's basically, it's a very simple thing to remember. Keep your equipment clean, free of holes and all that stuff. Make sure it's clean and dry because you have to have it for the next day. Now, I, what I found interesting, because you said Gore-Tex a couple of times, and when I actually saw the words how it's written, I was surprised by how it was written. It's G-O-R-E hyphen T-E-X. Yes, Gore-Tex. So that doesn't sound, it's, Gore doesn't sound like something helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just, you know, interesting to see the spelling. And then about layering, you know, that was something I learned in New Jersey. Nobody told me about that. It was cold. 
Yeah. And people used to laugh at me because I would always have an extra layer of clothing on, like tights or sweatpants or something. I walk around like the Michelin Man, but I was warm. <laughs> yeah, I'd walk outside in t shirt and flip flops in the snow. Not anymore. I couldn't do that. Not anymore. <laughs> Um, the Royal Marines provided this tip about caring for your boots. Um, and it says, as they have to, quote unquote, yomp everywhere on foot, often over long distances, Britain's Royal Marines have tried and tested uh, rules for the care of boots. First, stuff wet boots with newspapers and dry them in a warm, airy place, though not in direct heat, which will bake and then crack the leather. Uh, in water, also in water, uh, rub silicone or wax over the laces to stop them from freezing when they get wet. Um, your boots should be the size, your boots should be of a size that allows you to wear two or three pairs of socks underneath. Socks which are too tight will restrict the circulation and the layer of warm air that is between them, and this can lead to frozen feet. Always carry an extra pair, uh, spare pair of socks. Absolutely. <laughs> and whenever feet get wet, change socks as quickly as possible. Boots should be uh, also be as dried as best as they can. And Forrest Gump comes to mind. When yeah. Captain Dan was like, always take care of your feet. <laughs> yeah, so, so trench, you, you hear in a lot of military movies and a lot of guys will talk about, you hear trench foot. It's a real thing, and it doesn't necessarily have to happen with you always constantly stepping in wet conditions. If you get sweaty feet being inside boots, and your feet stay wet the entire day, and you don't have ample periods of dryness between, your skin your skin on your feet starts to turn white and crack. Three. Next we're going to talk about footwear. Uh, for any outdoor activity, it is best to equip yourself with a pair of waterproof boots. Training or tennis shoes should not be worn. They will not protect you from the cold and wet. The best kind of footwear for general backpacking is walking boots, which have a flexible sole with a deep tread. It is important to look after your boots, and it's also always wise to carry a spare pair of laces around with you. Keep the uppers supple and waterproof with a coating of wax or polish and always check your boots before you use them for broken seals, worn out treads, cracked leather, rotten stitching, and broken fastening hooks. Remember, if you look after your boots, they will look after you. And there's no reason you won't be able to get up to 10 years of use out of them if you do. Many backpackers wear nylon uh, gaiters over their boots to help keep water out when walking through wet grass and the like. Socks are important, are another important item of footwear, and most backpackers wear two pairs on their feet for comfort and to prevent blisters. Whether you wear a thin pair and a thick pair, two thin pairs or two thick, uh, two thick pairs is up to you, but find a combination that suits you before undertaking any serious walking. Now, a good example of, you know, like a, I guess general footwear to wear is with decent tread and that's waterproof. Yeah, those are waterproof. Yeah. Um, are these boots that my husband had in his inventory? So these they're not steel toe, but they're composite toe. And I was really interested in these. I've never worn anything like that, so I wanted to try them on because I know when you put these things on your feet, you're not supposed to be able to feel anything. But these boots, this is that high collar area they're talking about, and it's very flexible, if you see there. And it's it's like a nylon material, so it's like abrasion resistance. The deep treads, and that's all to keep uh, snow, water, and mud out and everything. A good pair of boots also, uh, they were talking about 10 years or more. Um, generally, when you talk about getting long service life out of boots, they got to have a replaceable sole, and these do. If you see, you got the hard rubber here. In here is your intermediate soft rubber, and then you got a thin layer of some type of cowhide or rawhide or something. When you wear the boot down, you can go a little bit into this rubber, and a shoe person can replace this tread. And what that does is you keep this upper part in good condition, and like the book said, it'll take care of you because these will be broken in. 
that's the always the hardest part about getting new boots is breaking them in. So yeah, these can last 10 years with the proper care and proper maintenance. But you're going to look all in here, make sure your seams are good. Just make sure everything and nothing is ripped and can get in there. Cause, eyelets and things that we're talking about. Yeah, all your eyelets are in good shape because uh, a good pair of boots goes a long way. And you see, I was hitting the end of it there with a knife. And although it was the blunt side, we don't have any penetration or anything in there. So just goes to show you, a good quality boots will take you a long way. All right, we're going to talk about uh, trousers next, which... We did show earlier, so uh, windproof trousers are recommended for outdoor use, but they should also be light and quick drying. Synthetic cotton uh, type weaves are the best. The, uh, the, better, the better makes the trousers are compact, lightweight, extremely quick to dry, even after being soaked. In addition, they have, a f they have around five pockets with zips, making them excellent for carrying items. Uh, the silk weights are excellent. Um windproof trousers but they do not have any pockets so that's the only downside um let's see what else we got here uh waterproof waterproof trousers uh again going into if you have a gore-tex material pants um if you have any type of rain gear uh they're, they're gonna fit over everything that you're already wearing uh should have some type of zippers or some way to secure them down with some rope, you know, to cinch it down to your body. Um, your jackets are going to form your outer shell. Um, basically, again, it's, a lot's going to dictate on your region, but you want it to be windproof and waterproof. Uh, Columbia jackets are a good example. Um, th those jackets, we like those. Uh, North Face jackets are another good example. You can find nice light ones to wear around all year and still offer some wind and water protection uh, without being too bulky. Um, sleeves should cover the hands and the jacket should have wrist fasteners so you can cinch them down, but it should also be big enough to accommodate uh, a few layers of clothing underneath it and allow the warm air you know, to flow into it. Uh, color is a matter of simple choice. Some people prefer military looking uh, camouflage while others want more pleasant colors like you know pink purple blue whatever uh it just again you don't want to be wearing a hot pink jacket and in a wooded area you're going to be a sore thumb <laughs> common sense it goes a long way in these things um you know jacket a uh, jacket is going to be one of the most important items you can have because how many times have you been cold and needed a jacket, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's literally can be just, the cold can penetrate you. So if you have a, uh, even a lightweight jacket, you'll be better off than without one. Uh, gloves, there are a host of wood gloves, ski gloves on the market, but mittens are better for heat retention. However, they can be very awkward if you want to use your fingers. Therefore, wear a thin pair of gloves under your mittens. So, um, with the gloves right here, these are definitely a, uh, a good option. You know, they're, let me zoom in real quick on these things. So these gloves here are like pilot gloves and they're wool. They got lamb skin on them. They do look bulky, but when you put your hands in it, you still have some dexterity and everything. Uh, there is a thinner pair of these gloves that go underneath it, but even with these big bulky ones on, you can still touch all your fingers and still you still have good mobility. And these things are warm. I've had these gloves uh, going on 15 years, and they're in great condition. Just keep them, you know, like moisturize and everything uh they've been through the wash a few times just be careful how you wash them but this is gore-tex sheepskin wool you get the best of all the worlds in these gloves you really gotta get your fingers in there you though. gotta you gotta get your fingers <laughs> to the top but once they're in there you can you're good yeah um you can find these at any army navy store really and they're they're just called like lightweight and heavyweight um flying gloves pilot gloves
And last but not least, headgear. So, it's estimated that between 40 and 50% of heat loss from the body in some conditions can occur through the head. Therefore, it is important to wear something on the head, which headgear can also provide protection from the heat in even hot weather. Um, any sort of woolen hat or baklava? Baklava. Yeah, that's exactly how it's pronounced. That does not look like how... Okay. Definitely well, pronounced baklava. <laughs> will help prevent heat loss, <laughs> though, of course, they are not waterproof. So just an example of that, too, is this is actually a face mask. This will go across your mouth, your nose, your eyes. Uh, there's a slit for your eyes here, and this goes across your forehead. That, along with this, over your head, will keep all that heat loss, you know. About, about half your heat loss. Yeah. As it comes through there. And I also, I realize definitely there's a lot of heat loss that occurs through your head. I always make sure that my head is covered, you know. If I have a blanket, the blanket's over my head because I know so much, like, feel so much warmer mm -hmm. when I keep my head covered. Yep. All right, well, so basically what what this all boils down to in a nutshell is um, you're, it's gonna be based on your region, your area. Again, if you live in the coastline in Florida and Miami, are you gonna be wearing these Gore-Tex pants Probably not, but should you have a pair of Gore-Tex boots? Absolutely. Uh, should you also have a pair of Gore-Tex pants? Why not? Uh, it's, 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 it's a cheap insurance that if you had to pack up and leave, you could take that with you if you were heading up north because some people are climatized to certain regions. Uh, personally, myself, I don't like hot regions. I can deal with them, but I will complain all the time. Um mm -hmm. On the, on the flip side, my wife loves hot regions and hates the cold. So it's always a uphill battle, you know, on finding the right temperature to suit everybody's needs. But as you see here, we just wanted to give these examples to show you the different types of clothing that you can wear. You don't necessarily have to get name brand ones. You can start out small, even if you get them little pocket ponchos for a dollar from the dollar store and you keep one for everybody in your in your car in your family car that's just one additional item you have as security if something happens and that's really what this is boiling down to to be prepared for any situation all right well that's it stay safe out there